Welcome to the Grace Force. This is the Grace Force podcast. We're so glad to have you here. And we have a special guest tonight. Uh, she's called the Purgatory Lady. Susan Tassoni's with us tonight. So we'll get into that in a second. But let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. Do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I always start out with the St. Michael prayer because, uh, you know, the Grace Force is about spiritual warfare. This is this is a collection of people, for those of you who are just coming on new, uh, that have just found each other, mostly through the internet, uh, and we have teamed up together, and uh, we have called ourselves the United States Grace Force. I like to say we're another branch of the military, but we are doing, we are doing warfare at probably the most um, important level, and that's spiritual warfare. And so uh, all of the people in our Grace Force are learning how to be the best spiritual warriors they can be and how to be as strong as they can be in the power of God's grace. So tonight we're so glad to have Susan with us. Uh, Susan Tassoni um, is, like I said, she's affectionately called the Purgatory Lady. Uh, she's, she's long been a, a passionate champion of, for the Holy Souls in Purgatory and is recognized as leading a whole worldwide Purgatory movement. Uh, the award-winning author, author of 11 bestsellers, including St. Faustina's prayer book for adoration. Susan makes uh, speaking appearances throughout the country. Over a dozen cardinals and bishops worldwide have endorsed her works. She's a frequent and popular guest on national radio and television programs, as well as social media. In 2013, she was featured in the groundbreaking uh, documentary Purgatory, The Forgotten Church and was on the cover of Catholic Digest magazine in 2017. She also continues to work tirelessly to raise donations for masses for the Holy Souls. And Susan holds a master's degree in religious education from Loyola University in Chicago and uh, had the honor and privilege of being granted two private audiences with St. John Paul II, who bestowed a special blessing on her and her uh, ministry of the Holy Souls. So, and, and Susan, I think you were mentioning while we were getting ready here that also uh, EWTN's, EWTN just recently said you are the best selling author of anyone on EWTN, or what, how did that go? Yeah, it was uh, quite a surprise. Father Joseph um, shared with me that uh, I was the all time best selling author in the history of the network. Wow, uh, that's, that's awesome. That's what I said. But but it just points to Father the, the, the how much love that people have for their dead, yeah, and absolutely. what great lengths people go to to make sure that their loved ones are okay. Yeah, you know, I, and I, I'll get into it a little later in the program. But I want to say up front that, uh, and I've told you too when we talked recently that mm -hmm. you really changed uh, my priesthood in a lot of ways. Uh, you got me to delve more deeply into this uh, beautiful devotion of praying for the holy souls with the saints. And uh, I actually uh, got very much into it, so much so I was inspired to make it a, a, a real feature of the book I wrote, um, Church Milton Field Manual, Special Forces Training for the Life in Christ. And I really have been advocating, along with you, for uh, people, you know, what I call building their holy alliance. So we can get into that uh, a little later. So we want to know, on, uh, we want to understand, uh, what does it mean, Susan? So um, the holy souls in purgatory... Can you just give us a little um, basic lesson, lesson on uh, what do we mean by all that? Yeah, Father. Um, you know, first of all, I'm going to I'll share with you just some of the the most common questions I have uh, gotten over the last 20 years. Uh, and if I have to I have to I have to redeem myself, though, with that title, the Purgatory Lady. I did not <laughs> sit there and go through as they do in the corporate world, you know, machine. It comes spits out different names for for <laughs> banks. It, it was it, it. I would never call myself that, to be no, honest right. with you. It was I, I'm going to uh, point the figure to Father um, Anthony at EWTN. Sure. 
Okay. Good old Father Anthony. We were uh, I was doing a show and and we were I was on the grounds and he was uh, he was you know walking on the grounds too, but he was at a distance and he saw me and he started shouting purgatory lady purgatory lady and i was i i thought who's he talking to you know um so that's where that name came from and so right. ew10 has branded me so i will have to wear a name tag uh before the throne of god for my judgment because i right. hopefully they will re, they were my worst fears that I'm, they're not going to know who i am so, yeah. <laughs> so so that's where that came from um and so, but, but who are the holy souls? This is the first question I get. Who are they? Well, first of all, they're the souls in purgatory. Uh, they're those who died in the state of grace, but are not yet cleansed um, to enter heaven. And and I just want to stop right there and say, you know, uh, that's another question is, you know, um, what's a happy death? Is a happy death um, to die with a smile on your face? Well, that would be nice, but I'll tell you what it's not. It's not to die in the state of Texas or the state of Wisconsin or the state of Illinois, but in the state of grace. And, yeah. and we have to, you know, always, you know, petition God and always be in the state of grace. So so who are they? Um, they're those that shed our joys, our sorrows, they're our mothers, our fathers, our children, grandparents, those who had a special interest in us, our friends, our teachers, um, our, our benefactors, the religious all those people that have been entwined in the fabric of our lives, that's who they are. They're not some third party. They're real people um, that, that we, we've lived with, we've, uh, that were part of our life, I should say. And so, so the next question I get, well, why does it exist? Well, first of all, I want to point out that it's a very positive part of our faith. Um, and it's, 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 it's not something we should hide. Um, and, and as, as I was, you know, in the beginning years doing this work uh, at conferences, they would come up to people would come up to me and were glad that I was talking about it because it kind of solidified that it was okay. Um, and the books that, that we published, they allow people to have focus and structure. That's why I do them. Um, Pope John Paul, the second St. John Paul and Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, um, all of them have this desire to renew this focus on the holy souls uh, it, it, throughout their pontificate. You know, you can look up the times they they spoke about, you know, praying for the dead. Um, why does it exist? It exists because of God's love. It's his mercy. And it's and it and exists because of his unspeakable and incomprehensible holiness. You know, God is all holy and he's all pure. And I and I just want to just quote from from one of my books um, that's very popular day by day um, for the holy souls. And um, it, it, it talks about um, about that. It says in purgatory, there's a conscious knowledge of God's exquisite purity in comparison to what all the highest ideals of our human conception of purity appear but foulness. Each holy soul learns to know itself as divine purity knows it. Purgatory exists because of God's love and his incomprehensible holiness. And we need purification and healing because of our selfishness and our sinfulness. It's, God, it's God's love that cleanses us and purifies us to be able to stand before his presence um, there was a, a story with uh, 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 St. Gertrude, uh, I believe it was St. No, it wasn't Gertrude. It was, um, it was Teresa of Avila, and, and she was on her deathbed. And, um, and during her agony, God allowed her to see his holiness as the angels and the saints see him in heaven, which caused her really so much dread that her sister's um, you know, said, you know, are, are you, are you worried? Are you afraid? Um, Cause she was so, she was weeping and she was, she was extremely agitated. And they said, is it, is, are you afraid of death? And she said, no. And she said, they said to her, do you fear, do you fear your sins or hell? And, and St. Teresa said, no. Then she said to the sister, she says, it's the holiness of God. She mm -hmm. says, my God have pity because of the holiness. So, so um, 
you know, be, because it, so it's his love that cleanses us and purifies us to be able to stand before this all pure, all holy God. Um, another uh, question I get or concern is, um, is purgatory a punishment? That's what I recall when I was growing up, that it's a punishment. Well, we could we could just cross that out because purgatory is not a punishment. It could only be called punishment in the sense that purgatory will be spiritually and psychologically demanding as any virtue is. I think too strong an emphasis on purgatory as a punishment is the wrong way to look at it. You know, God is not trying to get even with people. He's not trying to, to lower the boom on us. He, he doesn't say to us, you failed me completely or, or enough, I, I'm through with you. He's trying to prepare um, his, his children, um, you know, his un, he, he's trying to prepare his unprepared children for the joys of heaven. He's trying to help us complete the work that we've left undone on earth because we're all given a mission. And we're all charged by the gospel to prepare for heaven while we're alive on earth. And his, he extends grace after grace after grace countless times to help us prepare. But people, if they give little notice to him and they prepare much less seriously than they should have, that's when they find themselves in a very uncertain and pe precarious position. And, and so the question is, well, whose fault is that? You can't blame God. So purgatory is a place where shallowness and selfishness are overcome. It's a time for spiritual growth and maturing. So purgatory is God's merciful option for the incomplete, not for those who reject God altogether. Mm. Susan, a question for you. What, what would you say to people who had the attitude, and I run into this all over the country, um, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna shoot for purgatory. I'll be happy if I get to purgatory. It, That's the wrong way to look at it, um, yeah. because Doug, God doesn't want you to go to purgatory. You know, it's his, it, you know, it's his emergency room. He just like parents come straight home. We're given the grace to come straight home. You know, shooting for purgatory is basically insulting him. Um, mm -hmm. he, uh, he's given you everything you need to come to him directly. Um, but out of his mercy, thank God, I think Pope Benedict said this, Doug, he said, I would go so far to say that if there were no purgatory, then we would have to invent it for who would dare to save himself that he was able to stand directly before God. And yet we don't want to be, to use an image from scripture, a pot that turned out wrong that has to be thrown away. We want to be able to be put right. So purgatory basically means that God can put the pieces back together again and that he can cleanse us in such a way that we're able to be with him and, and can stand there in the fullness of life. But he wants us to come home. He wants us, to, you know, to hit the home run and not, you know, buy it, not bypass heaven and go to purgatory. He doesn't want that, but thank God he does that. We have it, you know, uh, yeah. because of our own sinfulness and our own shallowness, and, and he's, he's all merciful. So he knows us, but we don't have to go there. We're given the grace to avoid purgatory. How do you avoid purgatory? Number one, foremost way, and I learned this from Mother Angelica, and then, of course, after the, that first you know, learning from her and then studying for the past 20 years from all the great saints, Faustina, and, and it runs throughout her diary, doing the will of God in the present moment. And right. that's how you avoid purgatory. Well, and, and we're part of a communion of saints. You know, the, the church triumphant is, uh, is the angels in heaven. Um, the uh, church suffering or church penitent in, um, in purgatory. And then we're the church militant, but we're working together. We're meant to be a mighty force to be reckoned with. You know, uh, uh, listen, why don't we take a little break right now and we'll get into that because, um, I want to talk, too, about how you've inspired me so much, Susan, and our next segment is going to be all about how do we build our holy alliance. So we'll be right back. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host. 
by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. And we're back, everybody, here at U.S. Grace Force Podcast. Father Richard Heilman is here. I'm Doug Barry, and we have with us Susan, Susan Tonus with us. And Susan, we're talking about building the Holy Alliance. It just, that's just a powerful statement right there. Explain what is meant by building a Holy Alliance. Uh, for me, or for is that Father's, uh, father's specialty, well, I believe, correct? Yeah. Well, yeah, but you inspired it. I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know how important is it, Susan, that uh, we, that we be uh, side by side with the saints and and the holy souls of purgatory? Well, we're part of the you know we're part of the mystical body. One you know one reaches out to the other. We're all joined together. Um, we all you know one hand reaches out to the saints. Reach out to us. We reach out to the holy souls, and we're all we're all you know taking care of one another within the mystical body. And how do you, how do you help the, the church suffering? Um, there's, I call them the four pillars. Uh, what do we do to help them? Because, because in, in um, the catechism, number 958, um, you know, they're very powerful. Those, you know, they're a powerful alliance, if you will, Father, because the more you help them, and it's in the, it's in the catechism, the more powerful their intercession is for you. OK. Yeah. And so how do you help them? Number one, the mass, the, the highest form of worship, the highest act of prayer is the mass, attend mass. And a lot of people go to mass, dog and father, and they don't offer their intention. You can offer your mass. You can offer your indulgence. You can offer your communion for the souls in purgatory or a particular soul. Remember, too, we're, we're entering the month of November where the whole month is dedicated to the dead. There's not one saint that hasn't been you know, given a month, but the souls are given a whole month to remember, to, re, uh, to be remembered. And most souls really are released at Christmas, not all Souls Day. I see all Souls Day as the kickoff, you know, to get them home for Christmas. So the number, four, number one foremost way to help them is the mass gregorian masses uh i'll be saying this until until yeah. um, i die father mitch always reminds me uh, to say this when we're doing shows together put them in your will what are they they're 30 masses in a row for one to see soul not a family not a couple not someone who's alive one to see soul that was popularized by pope saint gregory one of the monks in his order um uh, died and um uh he was uh, his, his name was Justice and Justice's bro blood brother, Copiosis, was taking care of him before his death. Copiosis was a doctor. And so he took care of his his brother uh, during his last illness. And then after he died, Justice appeared to to Copiosis. And, and um, because at that point, uh, Pope St. Gregory had 30 masses offered for the for the soul. He ordered to have 30 masses offered for justice. Why 30? Why not 31? Why not 40? And the reason is, is 30. Again, we're talking about November, 30 days. That goes back to the Old Testament where Moses and Aaron and Jacob were mourned for 30 days. That's how they mourn their dead. He, he brought that back and popularized that again. And so we've got 30 days and after those 30 masses that were offered for justice, he appeared to Copiosis and Pope, Segre, uh, Pope St. Gregory and said that he was released from purgatory on the 30th mass. Now, that $64,000 question is, is, is this so really released after you have 30 masses offered? The church doesn't confirm it. What the church confirms is the power and the efficacy of the masses. But the Gregorian masses are very powerful and very important and put them in your will. And we promote, you know, when I'm on EWTN, a very legitimate place, nice. the Pious Union of St. Joseph. If you're going to have them in your will, you can designate them because they're legitimate and they're going to be said. Um, so that's that's the difference between an individual nice. mass and a series of masses. Did, yeah, did so you I, yeah, so I... Um, in our third segment, we're going to get into uh, how we how we can use the month of November. What I wanted to quickly do here uh, with just a few minutes left in this segment, we're doing briefer segments because of Susan's schedule here tonight. But uh, Susan, you really inspired me. Uh, you came here to my parish in 2009. And since then, my whole ministry has exploded because I believe that I am in league with a strong holy alliance. What did you do? You taught me that, and you said it earlier when we were talking, 
you that that it's not enough to just say you want the saints to pray for it. You have to get in a relationship with them. You have to engage them. That's what love is all about. Otherwise, it's kind of abusive of, of the relationship, right? If you just kind of you know expect them to be there for you and you, but you don't do anything about that. So you know, with your teachings, with a lot of other teachings, uh, I developed something. And again, this is all coming from you. But how to build your holy alliance? And and basically, I told people to gain indulgences for the holy souls in purgatory, but not just that. Engage a saint to pray for you as you're gaining that uh, indulgence. So like, say, uh, one of my favorite saints, because I share a birthday with him, is St. John the Baptist. So St. John the Baptist, mm. will you pray with me for my mom? Then what I do is I gain a plenary indulgence, and I teach how people can do that. There's actually um, four ways you can gain a plenary, plenary indulgence any day. If you adore before the Blessed Sacrament for at least one half hour, that's one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. If you read from sacred scripture for at least one half hour, that's two. Right, right. Devout, devout performing of the stations of the cross and approved stations. Right. Mm -hmm. And the last one is rec reciting the rosary with a member of the family or in a church. So you, Exactly. Yes, yep. So you can gain a, a, a plenary indulgence but see, now, if I ask St. John the Baptist to do that, and I gain that for my mom, what have I done? I put three, or I put two plus one plus myself, plus two more, in my holy allowance. Now I am a force of three. Tomorrow, I'll ask another saint, and I'll pray for another holy soul. Now I'm a force of five, seven, nine, eleven. And I'm holding this up, Susan. You're on the phone, and you couldn't be with us in video. But this is my journal. Okay, hold on. And these are all the people that I've been praying for for the years that you have taught me. All, wow. All to, uh, and, now, and Father, stop right there because you've been – see, there's, there's a question that will come up. You've been praying for them for years, okay? And so yeah. I get the question is, you know, well, what if they're in heaven? What if they're already in heaven? You um, can't assume that. You just I'll give you the answer. I'll give you the okay. answer. In fact, right. Mother Angelica it had me on a search for three years to find this answer because yeah. she talked about something right before she had the stroke. She had me on the edge of my seat and she goes, talked about something called accidental glory. And I'm listening to her. And, and after I heard that, I, th she had a stroke. And then it took me three years to, to do research up at the seminary here, and I found it. So let's say a soul is already in heaven, and you continue to pray for them. What do they get? You usually hear people that say that they, 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 the prayers go to somewhere else. It's much bigger than that. St. Thomas Aquinas calls it accidental glory. So if a soul is already in heaven, and you've been praying for him for 20 years, that soul gets two things. It gets an increase in its intimacy with God, and it's, it gets an increase in its intercessory power. So the lesson is never stop praying for your dead. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So anyways, uh, that's, um, the, you got a bunch of books. I wrote that one book called the Church Militant Field Manual. Um, and, it, and it outlines in there how to do it. And it actually gives you places where you can check off the saints that you've done already. And it gives some of the most popular saints. But anyways. Um, now, Father, I, you mentioned something else that people always seem to struggle with. You talked about indulgences. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I was writing a book, Praying with the Saints for the Holy Souls, and, and out of the whole book, that was the most difficult to try to explain. So yeah. I had to really dig in and figure out how to how to get that across. So first of all, why why do we have indulgences? Well, their purpose is to make up for the penances omitted or that were poorly done or that were too light in comparison with the with the enormity of the sin. And the best example that I, I love was was um, a, a Bishop Fulton Sheen, how he explained it. He said, it's like a nail in a board. Once you remove the nail, which is the sin, with confession, the hole, which is the punishment, remains to be filled. And mm -hmm. how do you how is that hole to be filled? By penance and reparation. So right. indulgence is fill that hole on earth by fulfilling a person's need to atone. Now, indulgences arise out of the mercy of Jesus. Um, and, and really, they're not a discount, okay? They're an aid for growth towards spiritual perfection, toward inner change, toward deeper conversion and of, a, of your heart. They're not a discount for 
for performing outward acts. So um, you have to have the right disposition uh, you know, to benefit from indulgences. And that word itself comes from, from the Latin, which means indulgentia, which is, which means to be tender. So Jesus lavishes his, uh, his, his mercy on us. And, and we have a treasure house of indulgences that you can gain, which you just mentioned um, every day. Yep. And so let's pick that up in the next segment, because we're going to talk about all the things that we can do for the Holy Souls in uh, the month of no- November, the month of the Holy Souls. So we'll be right back. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who asked for thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petition, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. We're back for our final segment of uh, U.S. Grace Force tonight, and uh, I want to get right into this because I know we're a little bit short on time with our guest, Susan. Susan, um, before we broke in the last segment, you talked about having the right disposition. I think that's a tough word for a lot of people to kind of put into, into position. There's the word again, disposition. So they understand it. So when we're doing these things to, to try to receive a partial or plenary indulgence, it's not just checking a box. Would it be accurate to say that the disposition is at the heart, the intention of the heart, behind the act so much as like a father uh, says I love you to his kids or a husband says I love you to my wife and some men might think well I said the words doesn't that cut it she wants to know that there's something deeper and interior behind those words is that what we mean by disposition that's exactly correct Doug it's it's the it's what's behind the words what's behind the words toward the love of your son or, or your wife, how do you express it? The words are as a beginning, but the behavior, the behavior, in fact, God judges the heart when you're being judged, he's going to be judging your heart, not your, you know, I, I, I went through the motions and I did it without any feeling or any care or concern. So that's a perfect example. Okay. So with the Holy souls, we can't just go through these prayers, these rosaries, uh, the Holy sacrifice of the mess and just say there, I wrote it down and I said it done. There has to be something interior really. There has to be right. But well, that's indulgences, you know, the righteous position, people that pray for the souls, they really have a heart because they're really concerned and they love their loved ones. Do you know, OSV did a Pew study um, and they, they asked that they asked the faithful in this study, what did they want to know more about than anything? You know, what was the what was the most important thing they wanted to have more information about? Guess what it was, Doug? Mm-hmm. Father, it was purgatory oh, because so- of the bond. You uh-huh. know, they have a bond with their loved ones, which is never broken. And so, so it's, it's not whether the Packers are going to win the Super Bowl. It, it's something. <laughs> yeah. There's no if I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> You're stepping into Chicago territory, Doug. Oh, <laughs> we don't right. have a lot of cheese here. <laughs> you got cheese graters. Yeah, yes, so, yes, yes. So listen, Susan, uh, we're heading into the month of the Holy Souls. So we got uh, yes, also- the month, the whole month, Father. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So can you help us? Uh, in, our title here is uh, uh, "Grief Graveyards and a Reason for Hope." I know I go and visit my, I, I have my name on a tombstone. My mom, my dad, and my younger brother have passed before me. And I, I want to do everything I can to help them get to heaven. And I, I always put it this way. I, I can't assume they're in heaven and do nothing. And I, I don't know one way or another. So I assume they need my help. And so what can I do, Susan, to help Well, them? we... We have something really special coming up, Father, it, uh, November 1st to the 8th. Um, an indulgence is granted to everyone that visits a cemetery um, and, and, you know, and prays for the dead. And you can apply. So, so what does that mean to gain the indulgence those first eight days? Mass, communion, um, prayers for the Pope, and confession within eight days. And then visit a cemetery uh, and say the prayers for the Pope in the cemetery on the first eight days. So an indulgence can be gained from November 1st to the 8th on those days. The rest of it, you know, visiting the cemetery on the other days of the year is a partial indulgence. So so that's really, uh, really powerful. Um, of course, offering your mass up 
uh, and your your communion um, are powerful for for your loved ones. Having you know masses offered, if you can do that, that's number one. Number alongside the mass is what the rosary. Why the rosary? Why the weapon? Because of the indulgence that are attached to it. And then alongside that, the way of the cross is very powerful for the souls in purgatory. Why? Again, because of the indulgences that are attached to it. Take your children to the cemeteries and teach the children, you know, how to pray for the dead. Um, Because if you don't and you don't plant that seed in their young hearts, you know what's going to happen? They're going to become godless. So you have to teach the children and form merciful and kind hearts in your children because you know, at the, when you're at the hour of your death, they're, they're going to know what to do. You know, you're going to be, you know, planting in their hearts that seed uh, of, of prayer. And in due time, it will manifest mess, manifest itself. So teach the children about All Souls Day. Take them to the cemetery. Sprinkle holy water on the graves. It's a, it's a sacramental that relieves and refreshes them. Um, teach, you know, teach the kids to go without something they enjoy that day and offer it up. Uh, the eternal rest prayer before and after meals is very powerful. Um, so those are, those are some of the things. Um, Light blessed candles is is very powerful. That that candle is really a sign of our prayer. It's a it's a silent intercessor for the holy souls. And adoration is very powerful. We're getting into Christmas. You know, you could put a special. I'm sure people that have lost their loved ones have a special ornament on their tree. Um, so. And that's a time of year where you can share the stories and the pictures of your deceased loved ones with the other children. Adoration, like I said, is very powerful, again, because of the indulgences. Um, sometimes I've even put the Gertrude prayer in my Christmas cards. You can do. Um, other uh, dioceses, especially Rockford Diocese, celebrate Cemetery Sundays during the whole month of November. Um, uh, there's a mass offered in, in uh, the cemetery every Sunday, but you can just visit the cemetery every Sunday. Um, you could even explore the traditions of your own heritage on All Souls Day. And the bottom line is pass it on, pass it on to the children. So those are some some things you can do. Powerful. Another one I would like to throw in there too is every time we drive past a cemetery with my kids, we raise them to try to get in the habit of just always remembering because we drive past cemeteries regularly. We they're in town, they're out of town, they're everywhere. And it's just that constant reminder right there. What an opportunity to put something into action, you know, whether it's just saying Gertrude prayer or just eternal rest prayer. Eternal just, rest prayer. Do you know, yeah. Doug, there's a true story um, that a friend of mine literally would pass cemeteries you pass the cemetery every day um, and would pray the eternal rest prayer. And after this is a true story. After two years, she was wondering, did my prayers help? Did my uh, did they get any help? Are they released? And this is true. So she's driving past the cemetery. She's coming up to the light and in front of her was a car and, and the license plate. You know what the license plate said? What? C-U-N-H-V-N. See you wow. in heaven. Wow. True story. Now, Susan, are you are you are you a bit selfish here? I'm just wondering. You're spending yeah. your life promoting this this devotion to praying for the holy souls. You're you're just wanting to rack up a lot of help from, from that department. <laughs> you better believe it, Doug. I need all the help I can get. You're These are the intercessors. These are the intercessors I want around my bedside. I don't want the ex-boyfriend there, you know. <laughs> I'll take I'll take all the, I you know, I have a special devotion like Father Miguel. Father Miguel has a huge devotion for um for uh priests in purgatory. So oh, I, I pray for priests, wow. I offer all my masses. Um, you know, that's one way to avoid purgatory is help the holy souls. So that they're helping me. And, you know, what do they do for you? You know, what's in it for us? You know, what is, this is what's in it for you. You know, they pray for you unceasingly. Right. They know who you are. The guardian angel informs who's praying for them. And, and they, you know, they 
have a special commitment to us because of two two benefits, because they're entering heaven sooner and this tremendous suffering that they're going through, which is the loss of the sight of God. That's what they're suffering. Their main suffering is they saw God, his glory, the lovableness of God, the majesty of God, and they're unable to be with him. And they suffer this burning desire of love for God. It's a heart sickness. It's a drought. It's a, it's an interior fever for love of God. And what we're giving them is this beatific vision. We're giving them God and they show their gratitude in proportion to the greatness of their enjoyment. Wow. So, um, and they also, especially in a very special way, um, our loved ones always are looking out for us and trying to warn us and pray to the Holy Spirit to inspire us not to sin and help us understand the malice of sin because they don't want us to go to purgatory. Nice. Well, Susan, thank you so much. This has been amazing. What a, uh, a wonderful time to do this just, just before we uh, head into November and first off with All Saints and then All Souls Day. Uh, I want to end with this quote from uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen. I just love this. Uh, he said, as we enter heaven, we will see them. So many of them coming toward us and thanking us. We will ask, who are they? And they will say, a poor soul you prayed for in purgatory. So let us pray. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. God bless you, Susan. Thank you, God Susan. God bless you, Doug. God bless you.